In this video we are going to talk about category theory. So, if you have ever wondered where functors, applicatives and monads come from and what their differences are, then this video is for you. However, I will not go into much detail when it comes to category theory itself. This video is about the application of category theory in Haskell. Okay, so let's start by defining what a category even is. In the last video we have defined algebras as a domain and operations. Since a category is an even higher abstraction of algebras, we are really talking about objects and arrows. And they look like this. A, B and C are objects while F and G are arrows. Additionally, we have some special arrows. First of all, we have identity morphisms, which are arrows that go from an object to itself. Then we also have a composition of arrows going from A to Z in this case. This is because we could go from A to C via the arrows F and G. So their composition is also a viable option. In a category, every object has at least one identity morphism and every arrow or morphism is composable. So the composition we see in this example is not optional, but necessary to have a valid category. Before we can talk about examples, we need to define some basic syntax. Given a category C, obj of C is the class of objects in C. An analogous, hom of C is the class of morphisms or arrows in C. And cab denotes all morphisms going from the object A to the object B. The composition of morphisms, which again is mandatory, has to be associative and a composition with an identity morphism is equivalent to that other morphism, called f in this case. Of course the identity doesn't change what object we are looking at by definition. And lastly, those identity morphisms are also mandatory. So let us look at an example. A subset of the natural numbers together with the smaller or equals operator is a category. Observe that for any objects in P this implication holds. If A is smaller or equal to B and the same holds for B and C then obviously this implies that A is smaller or equal to C. Additionally we can reinterpret the operator as a morphism. Now if two objects are in the smaller or equals relation we add a new special morphism for these two objects. So for A and B we would add smaller or equals AB. Again the existence of uh, smaller or equals for AB and BC implies the existence of AC. Now we can prove that this construction is indeed a category. Interpreting the operators as morphisms or arrows makes it possible to compose these distinct operators and thus create a new morphism equivalent to the morphism we needed to create. Obviously the operator is associative and an identity morphism does always exist since every object is smaller or equal uh, to itself. Okay. So now we have proven that any subset of the natural numbers together with the smaller or equals operator is indeed a category. Something interesting to note is that in our construction the objects always have either exactly one morphism or none. That is not the case for all categories but in our construction this is true. Another very important example is the type system of Haskell. As we can see in this example, we could create a new function by composing h, f and g which would have the type string to bool. Indeed, we also have uh, an identity morphism which is the identity function. Its type is obviously a to a and thus it preserves the type. Natural numbers also form a category with morph uh, morphisms denoting the adding of constants to any given number. These morphisms compose uh, by adding the constants. So plus 1 and plus 1 compose to plus 2. Plus 0 is the identity morphism for every single number. A category that will appear later is set, the category of sets. The objects are uh, all possible sets and the morphisms are given by every total function on every set. 
Of course, this category is rather large since it is infinite and is also pretty hard to visualize effectively. But this category will be very important later, so keep it in mind. An important notion to understand is that algebras are not categories. Or are they? Well, it turns out that we can reinterpret monoids as categories. The set uh, that the monoid was defined for becomes a single object and the operations for the monoid become morphisms. In fact, looking at the definition for monoids, we can see this notion in the type signature for m append. We interpreted m append as a binary function before, but currying the function yields a new function that takes a single argument and returns a new function. Thus, we end up at a very similar notion to the natural numbers we have seen before, which is why we denote the morphisms as adders again, uh, that add a certain constant. The object of the monoid is not important in this case. We can represent any constant by simply composing adders. The fact that the monoid only has a single object gives the monoid its name, by the way. We will return to monoids later when defining what a monad is. For now, we are interested in morphisms again. Not just morphisms in a category, but also morphisms between categories. Suppose we have two categories that are isomorphic. The identity morphisms have been omitted for clarity, of course. Then we could map the morphisms between these two categories and also the objects, which are somewhat implicitly mapped if the morphisms are mapped. This linking of categories is exactly what a functor is, a simple mapping between categories. As we have seen before, the types of Haskell are a categor uh, category by itself. Could this functor be used in order to map types? Well, let's look at the definition of functors. The important function that we want to take a look at is fmap. Looking at the type signature, we see that fmap takes a function going from A to B and taking an additional value in the functorial context. It then applies the function to the value inside the functorial context to get the end result. But is that really what's happening? Well, currying the function yields an fmap that only takes a single unary function and lifts it into the functorial context. This is exactly what we want in a functor. fmap now maps the morphism A to B to a new morphism which is in the functorial context. So let's look at some examples, specifically the instances for maybe and list. Suppose we have a function called toFloat that converts ints to floats. Functors are capable of putting this function into their context. We formally denote the context of a functor as a capital F. For maybes, this would look something like this. A maybe int can be converted into a maybe float by the application of fmap toFloat, which is the morphism in the functorial context. Here we see this application in context. Let us look at the list functor next, specifically the definition. It should not surprise us that fmap for lists is nothing but the map function. Going back to our two float example, here we can see that fmap as well as map are fine for the conversion. Which should make us think, is the application of map always a functor application? The answer is, Yes, indeed, which is quite amazing if you think about it. Every time we have used a simple mapping on lists, we have worked with a functor without really knowing it. Let's use our newly gained knowledge in order to prove that these two expressions are equivalent. By understanding the functions as morphisms in a category, we can see that the functions and the compositions of f and g and their respective mappings behave the same. This is given, uh, given by the isomorphism of the two categories. Since map is a functor, the two expressions have to be equivalent. The nice thing is that this is true for all functors. We prove this in the same way by generalizing the functor in this case. Okay, 
So now we have defined what a functor is. So now we come to a category that uses such a functor internally, the monoidal category. It is defined by a category C and a functor called the tensor product, taking two objects of C and mapping it to a single element. Additionally, there has to exist an identity object and three natural transformations called alpha, lambda and rho. These transformations have to satisfy so-called coherence conditions. Alpha has to satisfy the associativity of the tensor product and lambda and rho have to satisfy consumption of the identity object as the first or second argument for the tensor product. The reason we need these to be transformations is that often the tensor product is not really associative but could be made associative by doing an isomorphic transformation. We will see an example uh, of this in a second. The associativity of the tensor product is illustrated in this commutative diagram. It is not awfully important to understand this diagram but it is part of the definition for monoidal categories. In the same way, we can illustrate the consumption of the identity object. When thinking of an example of a monoidal category, we have to make sure that these diagrams still hold true. One example of a monoidal category is the set, the category of sets together with the cross product as the tensor product. This would look something like this. Yet, this creates some issues for our definition. Is the cross product really associative? As it turns out, no, it isn't. The parentheses are obviously shifted as we can see. However, this is not a problem since the two sets we can see here are isomorphic. The only thing we need to do is to shift the parentheses back, which can be done by the alpha transformation. Now the tensor product is associative. The full definition for the monoidal category looks like this. The category is the category of sets, the identity element is any fixed set with one element and the tensor product is given by the cross product. The identity element is explained by the cross product just copying the set with whatever the element in the fixed identity set was. Depending on whether the set was on the left or the right side of the cross product, we can use lambda or rho to filter the element and to reverse the cross product, thus restoring the old set. When thinking about how the cross product might look like, we might find a type signature looking like this, taking two arguments and creating the tuple from them. Interestingly, Using this function together with the internal types of Haskell and the empty tuple as the identity element gives us another monoidal category. That function is given by the internal function of Haskell, building tuples. And that's about it. We will see this monoidal category again in a few slides though. So, we have seen monoidal categories, so one question we might want to ask is, is it possible to create a morphism between two monoidal categories? And indeed, that is possible. We call such a morphism a monoidal functor. Given two monoidal categories C and D with their own respective identity elements and tensor products, a functor from C to D is a monoidal functor with a natural transformation that maps the application of the tensor product of D in the context of the functor to the application of the tensor product of C with the context of the functor applied afterwards. Of course, this transformation also needs to transform the identity element. Okay, so let's implement this notion of a monoidal functor as its own type class. Of course, we need a unit function as well as the notion of lifting the application of the tensor product into a new context. In our case, the new context is the construction of a tuple, which is what our functor is mapping to. So for lists, an instance would look like this, where the unit is the empty tuple, which is the identity element for constructing tuples, in the context of a list. So it's just a list with the empty tuple. The double star operator responsible for lifting our context can be constructed by doing the cross product on the list. Using zip, for example, wouldn't really be suitable since it could drop elements. Now that we have created the monoidal functor, let's compare it to the normal functor. 
We see some faint similarities to our old functor, especially the lifting done by fmap and the double star operator. The big difference is that the operator in the monoidal functor only treats objects that are in the same functorial context. This is different from fmap. Okay, but now let's ask another question. Is it possible to create a function similar to fmap that can lift a binary function? We will call this function lift2. Before we can define lift2, we have to define a special operator that will come in handy. This operator takes a function that is already in the functorial context and then applies this function to the internal value of f uh, of a. Thus, it operates on the internal values without ever leaving the context. So why does this definition work? Inferring the types shows that the application of the double star operator on mf and mx will yield a tuple of a function and a value in the functorial context. fmap now applies this function to the value and returns the wanted result. With the help of this operator we can now define lift2. Since fmap fx creates a function which is b to c in the functorial context, we use our newly made operator in order to lift it to a function f of b to f of c. Partial function application does the rest. But not only a lift2 is possible. With this new operator we can also define lift3 and even an arbitrary but fixed lifting is possible by recursively defining the liftings we need. So now you might ask yourself why we are even talking about monoidal functors and what all these definitions are supposed to tell us. Well, it turns out that the monoidal functors that we have defined are equivalent to applicatives. To be a bit more precise, the monoidal functors we are talking about are so-called lax monoidal functors. There are other monoidal functors, but we don't really care for them. So let us look at the definition of applicative functors or applicatives for short. They feature a pure function that lifts a value to the functorial context together with an operation that might look familiar to you. It is the function we have just defined a few slides earlier. And also we see that applicatives have their own lift2 function which is called lift a2. My claim is that applicative functors and monoidal functors are equivalent. So let's show that we can create the functions for either type class from the other type class. And indeed it is possible. Unit is defined by using pure on the empty tuple and the double star uh, is created by using the applicative uh, operator in conjunction with the function building a tuple wrapped into the functorial context. Pure can be built uh, from unit by using the fact that monoidal functors still have an fmap. So we use unit to create a structure that is only containing the empty tuple and then replacing it with a given value by applying fmap. The applicative operator can be defined in the fashion we have seen a few slides earlier. When looking more closely at the curried version of this operator we see that a function in the functorial context is not just lifted but also transformed into a normal function which is not in the context anymore. So this makes it possible to take functions in the functorial context and convert them into functions that we can easily compose for example. Let's look at what we can use applicatives for. First, let's observe this example usage of fmap, which is mapping putstringLN on getLine. Thus, this program will read one line from the standard input and write the line to the standard output. This can be rewritten by this operator with the same semantics as fmap. So now the question is, what if we want to read two lines, then concatenate them and then print the result to standard output? That cannot be done with fmap, yet it can be done with the applicative operator in conjunction with fmap. After the concatenation we can print the result like this. So why does that work? The operator for applicatives is equivalent to this little do notation snippet. But that combined with pure is enough to allow chaining of functions in the functorial context. Thus 
Applicatives are our entry ticket for input output and indeed they are one way of achieving input output operations without monads. Speaking of monads, let's start our discussion on them by looking at monoids. When talking about categories we already talked about monoids and how they can be interpreted as a category. Now we want to take a look at the formal definition of monoids. So. Suppose we have a monoidal category, then an object in C that we call M together with two transformations mu and eta form a monoid if mu transforms the application of the tensor product uh, to M twice to M itself and eta transforms the identity element to M. Mu is called the multiplication and eta is called the unit. In this commutative diagram we see that the tensor product still has to be associative via alpha from the definition of the monoidal category. Mu will now allow us to reduce every path in, the, uh, in these graphs in order to retrieve a single M. We see the same behavior in the diagram for the application of the tensor product with the identity element. This is also where monoids get the name from of course. We can always end up at the single element. Keep these properties in mind, they will come up in a second because now we are talking about monads. Here we finally are. A monad is a category C and a functor T which goes from the category to itself. Thus T is called an endofunctor. We also have two transformations eta and mu that seem very similar to the definition of monoids. Eta maps the identity functor to T the identity functor simply maps every object to itself. Ada now maps this functor to T. Mu maps two applications of the functor T to a single application of T. The coherence conditions are also very similar to monoids. Let's take a look at the commutative diagram. The left diagram tells us that we can use Ada on the left or the right side of T in order to get this double application of T which in the end can be collapsed again by mu. The right diagram shows us a very important rule for monads that make them so useful. Three applications of T can be condensed into a single application by the application of mu. In fact any fixed number of applications of T can be condensed this way. Now let's remind ourselves what a functor even does. It takes a category and puts it into a functorial context. So in a monad it doesn't matter if we put this context into another context since if the context is given by the same functor t we can condense it. Let's look at these transformations a bit more closely in order to understand their usage in Haskell. If we interpret the functor as putting a value into a context the type signature looks like this. The identity functor is the unchanged value and t is that value in the context of the monad. We will call ADA unit and mu join. As we can see unit takes a value and puts it into a monadic context and join deletes the outer context if the inner value is in the context of the monad. So how would we implement these functions? In order to create the implementation we will look at the maybe monad as an example. Of course maybe is the context of this monad. So the implementation looks like this. Unit simply takes a value and puts it into the maybe context by applying the just constructor. Join maps a just of x to x. Due to the type signature we know that x has to be a maybe so it is in the monoidal context. A nothing of course has to be mapped to nothing since we cannot invent a value used in the monoidal context. So that is great but it doesn't really give any practical functions to work with the values in our monads. So let's define a map function that applies a function to the internal value of the monad. Looking at the type signature it looks very similar to fmap again which is why we can simply use fmap. Of course this forces monads to also implement a functor and in Haskell they in fact do. Well really monads are not just any functor but applicative functors. 
The reason behind this is the property of applicative functors to not leave their context. Since monads really work in the same way and are used for similar applications to applicatives, it makes sense to force monads to implement the behavior of applicatives. Since applicatives force the implementation of functors, a monad also defines fmap. Okay, so let's look at the functions in the monad type class a bit more closely. The bind operator takes a monadic value and a function that operates on the internal type of the monad and returns a new monad with a new value or type. The anonymous bind ignores the first argument, its usage is clear when looking at the do notation. Return is similar to unit, it simply puts a value into the monadic context. So let's look at the implementation of these functions from the functions we have already defined of course. The bind operator is nothing but the application of map of f on x. Since f is returning a new monadic context and map is retaining the context, we now have the same context twice, so we delete it with join. The definition for the anonymous bind simply ignores the internal value of the monad and return is using unit in order to put a value into a context. And that's about it when it comes to the definition of monads. But it is clear that normally you would not define join but define the bind operator first. So is it possible to recover join from the bind operator? Indeed it is possible by using the identity function returning the internal monad of the outer context. Okay, so let's recap what we have seen so far. A functor is mapping one category to another. More precisely a functor maps some computation into the functorial context by using fmap. An extension to the functor is the applicative functor, which also makes it possible to lift functions that are in the functorial context in order to compose them. This makes it possible to chain functionalities that need their own context, like input-output for example. Yet another extension is the monad. The monad makes it possible to put a value into the monadic context and access that value with a function outside of this context without ever losing the context. This is exactly what makes it possible to facilitate any input output. We can facilitate side effects and still access the internal values by using the bind operator. We can still reason about monads in a purely functional way even though we can create impure functions by combining monads. So monads force us to never leave the monadic context. It is impossible for us to accidentally trip over side effects. In summary, functors, applicatives and monads have laws uh, that they need to obey. These laws directly stem from the laws that we discussed uh, coming from category theory. When implementing your own instances of these classes, your implementation should obviously obey these laws. And that's it. This has been a rather long and theoretical video, so I want to keep my conclusion short. Category theory is at the heart of programming, be it type theory, composition of functions or what have you. Category theory seems to always pop up, which makes sense. Category theory is trying to abstract domains and morphisms on these domains, which essentially is what we are doing when programming. We have domains, be it of a type or a value kind, and we are defining morphisms on these domains. That's what programming is. So. If you want to learn more about this theory, I would highly recommend the lecture Programming with Categories. A link to the playlist is in the description. A book I can recommend is Bartosz Milewski's Category Theory for Programmers. In general, it explains concepts in a more practical sense. And if you uh, already have exposure to programming, which I assume you do, this book uh, is a nice introduction to the subject. Yet another work I want to point your attention to is Seven Sketches in Compositionality by Brandon Fong and David Spivak. It generally explains more applications of categories, especially when it comes uh, to getting a more visual understanding. By the way, Fong, Spivak and Malewski are the lecturers of the aforementioned lecture.
If you are interested in applicatives and the motivation behind them, a helpful work might be Applicative Programming with Effects by Connor McBride and Ross Patterson. A more academic work, yet not too hard to understand if you are familiar with Haskell. Okay, and that's about it. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching. You wouldn't believe how many coffees I run through making one of these videos. If you'd like to support them, you can do so on Ko-fi, where you can, well, buy me a coffee. Any support is greatly appreciated. Thank you.